this is Baruch Fleischman here. I'm at the Tikkun Elevator Kolo, and we've been reading about the spiritual creative creativity in the Middle Ages by the Tosafists. Now, that has some explanation and background to be able to understand this. This is the book, The Atlas of Medieval Jewish History, and I titled this series, Is That How the Jews Survived the Middle Ages? Now, what's the survival got to do with it? Uh, remember back that I sped, said to you in the beginning that when you read the Bible and you read the story of Isaac who had two sons, one was named Esau, or Esau and the other one's called Jacob or Jacob. Esau and Jacob were polar opposites in their natures. Esau was the firstborn and he was a man who came out really red and he was really covered in hair which you see sometimes in kids when they're when they're first born. He was all red, very reddish, reddish, reddish person. And as he was coming out, it turned out that his brother Jacob, Yaakov, was holding on to his heel, still stuck onto him. And looked like, like they were came out together, but Jacob is on the bottom, holding on to the leg, to the bottom of the leg, with the heel, the foot of Asa. It's like Asa couldn't get rid of him. Asaph was a man of the field and he had appetites. Both Jacob and, and uh, Esau realized that they would not live forever. So Asaph's motto was the motto, uh, well, live for today because tomorrow you die. And so he did. He was a powerful man, a very strong man. And he was able, he became unfortunately involved in blood. His cover was red. He killed, he raped. He did lots of different things, and he was not really fit to become a priest not at all. On the other hand, his, he was in tremendous competition with his brother, to whom he sold his birthright, which actually refers to the, the priesthood of the family, the religious part. And his brother, Jacob, was a man who lived in tents. He was a study. He was a student. His approach to realizing that, he would not, his physical body would not live forever. And under the teachings really of his father to a great extent, he realized that he needed to connect with the world beyond. What brought him here? What is that force of energy that brought him here? And these brothers struggled. They struggled over the birthright. They struggled over inheritances. And it became a blood hate for Asaph because he felt that his brother had taken his blessings away from him and so on and so forth. Now we come, that was approximately 3,500 years ago. <laughs> now we come all the way back 2,500 years later, and we're starting, let's say, at the, at the year 1,000 and going further. Rashi was approximately the year, according to the current uh, count, uh, 1,000 years, uh, about the year 1,000. So here we talk, here we are in the beginning, and his grandchildren become what are called the Tosafists. Let's see if we can really get it on the page. That's with the Tosafists. That is, they add something on. Rashi came along at a time, and this is for Jews that came or are called the Ashkenaz Jews. And the order, or the origin of where those Jews came from versus the origin of the Mediterranean Jews, this is something that we've seen over here, is that they really have a strong connection to both uh, Italy, the northern part of Italy, and also at the same time, uh, to Babylonia, which is far away. But Charlemagne saw that it was important for the Jewish community, was making money for him, uh, to have leadership, and he brought it from far away, which was a very famous pl pl place at that time, in, they say, the 900s or the 1000s, like that. And as a result of that, great knowledge came in. And so Rashi became a person who was able to gather that knowledge and study it, and he produced uh, yeshivos, and we see here all the different places in the spiritual in, in in Europe, and we're talking about Western Europe here. We have England over here on the left, and look, all of these schools, these are all yeshivot, who study the Word of God. This is what Jacob does, but he's living on the ground of his brother, because the rabbi said that Esav, that is our brother Esav, he Romi, it's Rome. Wherever you see the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, there you see the remnant of our brother Asaph and his commitment to, well, in some ways he can't do without us, but on the other hand, he deals with blood. That is his line, and we have lived and survived amongst them 
for all these thousands of years, these last 2,000 years after we were massacred in, in two different wars that we had with the, Ro with the Romans. And in the end, we were taken back as slaves into Italy. And you see here the jug development of the Ashkenaz community, along with a possibly a, a Babylonian element that comes into it because the Babylonian Talmud is extremely important to Ashkenaz Jews. So here we have the Tosafos and all of their schools. And let's go on to look at what the Tosafos did as we could read the the text here. I think it's a little too shiny there uh, for uh, of uh, Dr. Chaim Beinart. He writes, the works of the Tosafos reach Bohemia. That's Central Europe. Pupils from Prague, Elazar ben Isaac and, and Isaac ben Yaakov Halavan, Brothers of the famous traveler, I don't know this name, but Bittityahu of Regensburg, came to Ramarupt to study the Rabbeinu Tam with Rabbeinu Tam. Some of these scholars were active in Ashkenaz and others in Bohemia and Russia. Now, Ashkenaz is the Hebrew word for Germany. So those are the Teutonic areas. The Tosafist Peter Bayai by Bar Joseph of Corinthia in Austria, participated in editing Sefer Hayasher by his teacher, Rabbeinu Tan, adding his own glosses. That is, he wrote on the sides of it his own, trying to get more deep understanding of his teacher. He died a martyr during the Second Crusade. So all of those who, of you who listened to the Yeshua and, and uh, think how proudly it was of the Crusaders, my family, I knew people whose families were descended from Crusaders. But if you're Jewish... The Crusades was a real, real horror. In Hungary, there were two protosophists, Abraham and Proselyte, the Proselyte, and his son Isaac the Proselyte. So, Ramarup, I don't know the pronunciation here really, Regensburg and Dampierre were important Tosophist centers. These are Yeshivot, places of studying, like in the tent of Jacob. That's what the Jews do. When you give us room, we become teachers and students. The Regensburg School, having such scholars as Yoel ben Isaac Alevi and his son Elazar ben Yoel Alevi, known as the Ravya. The head of the school in Dampierre was Isaac ben Abraham, known as the Ritzba, who was the grandson of Shem, uh, Samson ben Yosef of Falais and had been pri privileged to study with Rabbeinu Tam. These are people who are all setting up schools. The Ritzba was a great holocaust and rabbinical judge, whose decisions were accepted by scholars of many generations. Among those who sought his opinion on aspects of Jewish law was Jonathan ben David, Jonathan ben David, Hakohen of Lunel, an admirer of, of Maimonides, the Rambam. The Ritzba was pr probably familiar with the Rambam's writings, since he was the recipient of one of the letters sent by Mayor Ben Todos, Todros, Abu Lafia of Toledo, to the rabbis of southern France regarding the Rambam's doctrine of the resurre re resurrection. Now, this is a side issue, is is that the Rambam, who was Sephardic, not Ashkenaz, so there wasn't a lot of communication we're seeing here between the Ashkenaz and the Sephardic. They developed completely differently. So the, uh, and we will get to that. His younger brother was Samson ben Avraham of Sens, who was particularly noted for his commentary on several, several orders of the Mishnah for his use of the Jerusalem Talmud as a source for halachic decisions. Little is known of his life, but his literary legacy is greater than that of the other Tosfas. The bulk of his work has been preserved by, in his own language and not reworked by his pupils. He emerges from this as a great scholar whose world was steeped in the halacha. And the halacha means the laws given by God to Jewish people, how to understand them. So after Samson of Sens migrated to the Holy Land, and this was uh, at, at the beginning of the 13th century, so now we're at the 1200s, Paris became the center of Torah study in northern France. Its school was headed by Yehuda Bar Isaac, known as Yehuda Sir, uh, Yehuda Sir Leon of Paris, uh, 1166 to 1224. So you see that in Paris itself, there's tremendous learning. 
So he said, Paris, uh, so he, and pupil and relative of Isaac Ben Samuel of Dampierre, known as the Azakain, the old man, the, the old one. The school was closed in 1182 when the Jews were expelled from the kingdom of France by King Philip II Augustus, but was reopened in 1198. Now that's a gap of what, 16 years? That the Jews were not allowed to have this this school open. Now you could see the possibility for this happening if the woke people really, really got in, and they were able to actually don't like the way the Jews think, and uh, they might have a problem with our schools because we have millions of schools now that are developing everywhere. Schools on top of schools, schools for the kids that can't make it here, the kids at school that get are doing excellent, going back and forth, all different kinds of schools for all different kinds of people. That's us. When the Jews were allowed to return, that's when we came back in 1198. Yechiel of Paris, Moses of Cusi, and Isaac Ben of Vienna studied and were acted in this school. So understand, it's a, here we are. Let me see if we can find Paris. is over here someplace. Some of these, this is Ramarup. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's near the Seine. Uh, somewhere in here is Paris. I'm not sure exactly. Maybe you could figure it out. I didn't look ahead of time, and I'm really sorry about that. But this is showing all the different yeshivot. Now, we're in the middle of medieval France. Nobody knows how to read or write. The church controls everything, and they don't like us. But on the other hand, we make money for the crown, and it's a good thing to have us around. It's uh, like a mixed bag. But in the end, you see what happens. So let's go on. We went through that. Uh, da, 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 da. We must be over here somewhere. Here we go. So the Jews were allowed to return. Yechiel of Paris, Ma Ma Moses of Cusi, and Isaac ben, ben v of Vienna studied and were active in this school. I beg your pardon, in this school. Asher ben Yechiel, who was the Rosh, lived between the years 1250 and 1327, was an outstanding scholar. And he became a leader of German Jewry, the Jews who lived in Ashkenaz, who in 1303, he left Germany for Spain because the situation was becoming very precarious. And he left there to take up a position as rabbi in, this, in the Spanish city of Toledo. He introduced the system, the system of study, Ashkenaz Tosafis, into Spain. So then you see that this kind of limud now is coming out from the Rosh. Jewish creativity in France declined after the disputation of Paris in 1240. This was an argument, and they call it disputation, but basically it's standing up Jews against the church. The church is going to win, we know that at the beginning. So he says, again, it was declined after the disputation of Paris in 1240. And then finally, after that, in 1242, they started burning the Talmud. And when you burn the Talmud, in those days, they didn't have a printing press. So everything was written by hand, and they were in scrolls to a great extent. So if you take all of those scrolls, not like books like we have today. So he says, so if you take them and you burn them, you're out of business because you don't know the subjects anymore. You don't get back into it. Now, the, the point is that those who study Torah, realize that the Torah is actually an elevator. And that's one of the reasons why we call the Torah the Tikkun Elevator Kolel. Because studying Torah, reading into this, actually allows a person to connect with the infinite. That's what Jacob, our father, does. And he unites all different kinds of things in that lima. When you take it away, then it becomes a problem. What do we do? So with the destruction of the French Jewish villages and their expulsion in 1396, this great spiritual achievement came to an end. That is the time of the Tosafos and their schools. The Ashkenaz, uh, Jewish creativity in, uh, we did that. The Ashkenaz Hasidic movement developed in Germany during the 12th and 13th centuries. Now, this is not the Hasidim that we see today. This is something else. Uh, this is people, Hasidim, Hasid, uh, is a concept of a righteous person. Hasid in Hebrew means kindness. So a person who has really perfected the ways of being good and being kind. So he says, Samuel Balkolonimus, the the Hasid of Spire, and his son Yehuda Hasid of Regensburg, and these are, this is his the dates, were the founders of the movement, and their most important work was a place called, or was a sefer called Sefer Hasidim, a book of pragmatic, true to life, ethical teachings which reflect the contemporary life of German Jewry in their Christian environment. 
In other words, how to behave. And especially that with different kinds of people, you know, like we're in business and that we're in business also with Gentiles and we're in business and we're doing business with Gentiles all the time. How to behave. What do we show ourselves to be? The book preaches spiritual revival and instructs the pious on avoiding sin and on leading a righteous life that will ensure his salvation in the life to come. Various Weltanschauungen, that means outlooks, Weltanschauung really refers to worldview, are expressed in the book, and scholars believe that some of these were influenced by ideas prevalent in the area. Even as languages of the text, like say sometimes the text was in German and then sometimes in French, indicate such influences that they didn't, it wasn't always, and we see this a lot in, in the, in the Teisvis, that they use French words or German words for different ideas. The Hasid, the protagonist, is betrayed as the ideal. In his conduct, his full Jewish life, and his relationships with his Christian neighbors, while he is fully aware of the grim realities which surround his people, he is called upon to bear the burden of the community and leave it, lead it along the true path. Now let's see this one more time. He says, in his conduct, his full Jewish life, and his relationships with his Christian neighbors, while he is fully aware of the grim realities which surround his people, it's so the thing about uh, everybody that's not Jewish should know that the blood libels Jews are like, say, if you crack an egg and it has a little blood in it, you have to throw it out because we don't eat blood. So here the Christians come along and say that they were sucking the blood out of their children to make matzahs. Okay, this is something that only that crowd of people would ever think to do, but it's a big crowd. So he said, while he is fully aware of the grim realities which surround his people, he is called upon to bear the burden of the community and lead it along the true path, because the path of truth is the path, irregardless of what's going on around you. This is Baruch Fleischmann. This is Dr. Chaim Beinhardt. How the Jews survived the Middle Ages.